Part two, chapter twenty of Eight Hundred Leagues on the Amazon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Robbins. Eight Hundred Leagues on the Amazon by Jules Verne. Part two. THE CRYPTOGRAM CHAPTER Twenty, THE LOWER AMAZON Little remains to tell of the second part of the voyage down the mighty river. It was but a series of days of joy. Juan Jacosta returned to a new life, which shed its happiness on all who belonged to him. The giant raft glided along with greater rapidity on the waters now swollen by the floods. On the left they passed the small village of Don José de Maturi, and on the right the mouth of that Madeira, which owes its name to the floating masses of vegetable remains and trunks denuded of their foliage, which it bears from the depths of Bolivia. They passed the archipelago of Canini, whose islets are veritable boxes of palms, and before the village of Serpa, which successively transported from one back to the other, has definitely settled on the left of the river, with its little houses, whose thresholds stand on the yellow carpet of the beach. The village of Silves, built on the left of the Amazon, and the town of Via Bella, which is the principal Guarana market in the whole province, were soon left behind by the giant raft. And so was the village of Faro, and its celebrated river of the Namundas, on which in 1539, Orellana asserted he was attacked by female warriors who had never been seen again since, and thus gave us the legend which justifies the immortal name of the river of the Amazons. Here it is that the province of Rio Negro terminates. The jurisdiction of Pará then commences, and on the 22nd of September the family, marveling much at a valley which has no equal in the world, entered that portion of the Brazilian Empire which has no boundary to the east except the Atlantic. "'How magnificent!' remarked Minha over and over again. "'How long!' murmured Manuel. "'How beautiful!' repeated Lina. "'When shall we get there?' murmured Fragoso. And this was what might have been expected of these folks, from the different points of view, though time passed pleasantly enough with them all the same. Benito, who was neither patient nor impatient, had recovered all his former good humor. Soon the jangada glided between the interminable plantations of cocoa trees, with their somber green flanked by the yellow thatch or ruddy tiles of the roofs of the huts of the settlers on both banks, from Obidos up to the town of Monto Alegre. Then there opened out of the mouth of the Rio Trombetas, bathing with its black waters the houses of Obidos, situated at about 180 miles from Belém, quite a small town, and even a citaji, with large streets bordered with handsome habitations, and a great center for cocoa produce. Then they saw another tributary, the Tapajos, with its greenish-gray water descending from the southwest, and then Santarém, a wealthy town of not less than five thousand inhabitants, Indians for the most part, whose nearest houses were built on the vast beach of white sand. After its departure from Manaus, the jangada did not stop anywhere as it passed down the much less encumbered course of the Amazon. Day and night it moved along under the vigilant care of its trusty pilot. No more stoppages either for the gratification of the passengers or for business purposes. Unceasingly it progressed, and the end rapidly grew nearer. On leaving Alamque, situated on the left bank, a new horizon appeared in view. In place of the curtain of forests which had shut them in up to then, our friends beheld a foreground of hills whose undulations could be easily descried, and beyond them the faint summits of veritable mountains van dyked across the distant depth of sky. Neither Yaquita, nor her daughter, nor Lina, nor old Cybele had ever seen anything like this. But in this jurisdiction of Pará, Manuel was at home, 
and he could tell them the names of the double chain which gradually narrowed the valley of the huge river. To the right, said he, that is the Sierra de Paraguarta, which curves in a half-circle to the south. To the left, that is the Sierra de Curuva, of which we have already passed the first outposts. Then they close in? asked Fragoso. They close in, replied Manuel. And the two men seemed to understand each other, for the same slight but significant nodding of the head accompanied the question and reply. At last, notwithstanding the tide, which since leaving Obidus had begun to be felt, and which somewhat checked the progress of the raft, the town of Monto Alegre was passed, and then that of Pravagna de Omteru, then the mouth of the Shingu, frequented by Yurumas Indians, whose principal industry consists in preparing their enemies' heads for natural history cabinets. To what a superb size the Amazon had now developed, as already this monarch of rivers gave signs of opening out like a sea. Plants from eight to ten feet high clustered along the beach, and bordered it with a forest of reeds. Porto de Mos, Boa Vista, and Gurupa, whose prosperity is on the decline, were soon among the places left in the rear. Then the river divided into two important branches, which flowed off toward the Atlantic, one going away northeastward, the other eastward, and between them appeared the beginning of the large island of Marajo. This island is quite a province in itself. It measures no less than a hundred and eighty leagues in circumference, cut up by marshes and rivers, all savanna to the east, all forest to the west. It offers most excellent advantages for the raising of cattle, which can here be seen in their thousands. This immense barricade of Marajo is the natural obstacle which has compelled the Amazon to divide, before precipitating its torrents of water into the sea. Following the upper branch, the Jangada, after passing the islands of Caviana and Mechiana, and would have found an embouchure of some fifty leagues across, but it would also have met with the bar of the Poruroca, that terrible eddy which, for three days preceding the new or full moon, takes but two minutes instead of six hours to raise the river from twelve to fifteen feet above ordinary high water mark. This is by far the most formidable of tide races. Most fortunately, the lower branch, known as the Canal of Breves, which is the natural area of the Pará, is not subject to the visitations of this terrible phenomenon, and its tides are of a more regular description. Araujo, the pilot, was quite aware of this. He steered, therefore, into the midst of magnificent forests, here and there gliding past islands covered with Muritis palms, and the weather was so favorable that they did not experience any of the storms which so frequently rage along this Breves Canal. A few days afterward the Jangada passed the village of the same name, which, although built on the ground flooded for many months in the year, has become, since 1845, an important town of a hundred houses. Throughout these districts, which are frequented by Tapuyas, the Indians of the lower Amazon become more and more commingled with the white population, and promise to be completely absorbed by them. And still the Jangada continued its journey down the river. Here, at the risk of entanglement, it grazed the branches of the Mangaliers, whose roots stretched down into the waters like the claws of gigantic crustaceans, then the smooth trunks of the Paletuviers, with their pale green foliage, served as the resting places for the long poles of the crew as they kept the raft in the strength of the current. Then came the Tocantins, whose waters, due to the different rivers of the province of Goyaz, mingle with those of the Amazon by an embouchure of great size, then the Moju, then the town of Santa Ana. Majestically the panorama of both banks moved along without a pause as though some ingenious mechanism necessitated its unrolling in the opposite direction to that of the stream. Already numerous vessels descending the river, ubas, egariteas, vijalandas, pirogues, of all builds, and small coasters from the lower districts of the Amazon and the Atlantic seaboard, formed a procession with the giant raft, and seemed like sloops beside some might man of war. At length there appeared on the left Santa Maria de Belén do Pará, the town, 
as they call it in that country, with its picturesque lines of white houses at many different levels, its convents nestled among the palm trees, the steeples of its cathedrals, and of Nostra Senora de Merced, and the flotilla of its brigantines, brigs, and barks, which form its commercial communications with the old world. The hearts of the passengers of the giant raft beat high. At length they were coming to the end of the voyage, which they had thought they would never reach. While the arrest of Juan detained them at Manaus halfway on their journey, could they ever have hoped to see the capital of the province of Pará? It was in the course of this day, the 15th of October, four months and a half after leaving the fazenda of Iquitos, that, as they rounded a sharp bend in the river, Belén came into sight. The arrival of the jangada had been signaled for some days. The whole town knew the story of Juan Jacosta. They came forth to welcome him, and to him and his people accorded a most sympathetic reception. Hundreds of craft of all sorts conveyed them to the fazender, and soon the jangada was invaded by all those who wished to welcome the return of their compatriot after his long exile. Thousands of sightseers, or more correctly speaking, thousands of friends crowded on to the floating village as soon as it came to its moorings, and it was vast and solid enough to support the entire population. Among those who hurried on board, one of the first pirogues had brought Madame Valdez. Manuel's mother was at last able to clasp to her arms the daughter whom her son had chosen. If the good lady had not been able to come to Iquitos, was it not as though a portion of the fazenda with her new family had come down the Amazon to her? Before evening the pilot Araujo had securely moored the raft at the entrance of a creek behind the arsenal. That was to be its last resting place, its last halt, after its voyage of eight hundred leagues on the Brazilian artery. There the huts of the Indians, the cottage of the Negroes, the storerooms which held the valuable cargo, would be gradually demolished. There the principal dwelling nestled beneath its verdant tapestry of flowers and foliage, and the little chapel whose humble bell was then replying to the sounding clangor from the steeples of Belen, would each in its turn disappear. But ere this was done, a ceremony had to take place on the jangada, the marriage of Manuel and Mina, the marriage of Lina and Fragoso. To Father Passagna fell the duty of celebrating the double union which promised so happily. In that little chapel the two couples were to receive the nuptial benediction from his hands. If it happened to be so small as to be only capable of holding the members of Jacosta's family, was not the giant raft large enough to receive all those who wished to assist at the ceremony? And if not, and the crowd became so great, did not the ledges of the river banks afford sufficient room for as many others of the sympathizing crowd as were desirous of welcoming him, whom so signal a reparation had made the hero of the day? It was on the morrow, the 16th of October, that with great pomp the marriages were celebrated. It was a magnificent day, and from about ten o'clock in the morning the raft began to receive its crowd of guests. On the bank could be seen almost the entire population of Balain in holiday costume. On the river, vessels of all sorts crammed with visitors gathered round the enormous mass of timber, and the waters of the Amazon literally disappeared, even up to the left bank beneath the vast flotilla. When the chapel bell rang out its opening note, it seemed like a signal of joy to ear and eye. In an instant the churches of Belen replied to the bell of the jangada. The vessels in the port decked themselves with flags up to their mastheads, and the Brazilian colors were saluted by the many other national flags. Discharges of musketry reverberated on all sides, and it was only with difficulty that their joyous detonations could cope with the loud hurrahs from the assembled thousands. The Jacosta family came forth from their house, and moved through the crowd toward the little chapel. Juan was received with absolutely frantic applause. He gave his arm to Madame Valdez. Yaquita was escorted by the governor of Belen, who, accompanied by the friends of the young army surgeon, had expressed a wish to honor the ceremony with his presence. Manuel walked by the side of Mina, who looked most fascinating in her bride's costume, and then came Fragoso, holding the hand of Lina, who seemed quite radiant with joy. Then followed Benito, 
then old Cybele and the servants of the worthy family between the double ranks of the crew of the Jangada. Padre Passagna awaited the two couples at the entrance of the chapel. The ceremony was very simple, and the same bands which had formerly blessed Juan and Yaquita were again stretched forth to give the nuptial benediction to their child. So much happiness was not likely to be interrupted by the sorrow of long separation. In fact, Manuel Valdez almost immediately sent in his resignation, so as to join the family at Iquitos, where he is still following the profession of a country doctor. Naturally, the Fragosos did not hesitate to go back with those who were to them friends rather than masters. Madame Valdez had no desire to separate so happy a group, but she insisted on one thing, and that was that they should often come and see her at Belém. Nothing could be easier. Was not the mighty river a bond of communication between Belém and Iquitos? In a few days the first mail steamer was to begin a regular and rapid service, and it would then only take a week to ascend the Amazon, on which it had taken the giant raft so many months to drift. The important commercial negotiations, ably managed by Benito, were carried through under the best of conditions, and soon of what had formed the Shangada, that is to say, the huge raft of timber constructed from an entire forest at Iquitos, there remained not a trace. A month afterward, the fazender, his wife, his son, Manuel and Mina Valdez, Lina and Fragoso, departed by one of the Amazon steamers for the immense establishment at Iquitos, of which Benito was to take the management. Juan Jacosta re-entered his home with his head erect, and it was indeed a family of happy hearts which he brought back with him from beyond the Brazilian frontier. As for Fragoso, twenty times a day was he heard to repeat, What? Without the liana? And he wound up by bestowing the name on the young mulatto, who, by her affection for the gallant fellow, fully justified its appropriateness. If it were not for the one letter, he said, would not Lena and Liana be the same? End of chapter 20 The Lower Amazon End of 800 Leagues on the Amazon by Jules Verne